Good morning, everyone. Um, please do let me know uh, whether you can hear me properly. It might happen that I start talking too fast later when the conversation gets heated. So uh, let's keep track of the audio quality for the room and for our friends who are following on Zoom. This, uh, web, uh, this workshop um, is designed to give you a glimpse of what we have been doing as the Ludwig Wittgenstein project, but also uh, to gather your feedback about what has been done so far, about our plans going further, and really the idea, the reason why we thought of making this a workshop was to have a conversation as much as possible. So I have a plan to discuss three main topics. Uh, so to divide the two hours lot into three parts that should be approximately of equal length, but we do have some flexibility. If something is particularly interesting, it's definitely worth dedicating a bit more time to that. And unlike previous sessions, we agreed to um, try to mix the questions together with the presentations uh, a, a bit more, actually to do that instead of leaving all the questions for the end of each of the three parts, which I was again planning to, um, uh, to, to divide the presentation into. So really, if you would like to comment or to uh, ask a question, uh, to clarify something, etc., just try and raise your hand. And if we see that this can work, uh, we, will, we will follow this sort of procedure. So this is a two hours lot, not because uh, it is more interesting to talk about the Wittgenstein project than about the other wonderful things we heard yesterday and this morning, but because uh, we thought in this way we could really have a more uh, relaxed uh, conversation about this issue. And the reason we call this a workshop is that uh, it's really not about presenting the results of some research, but rather to describe something that is in progress and really to, to make some plans, or at least to, to, to gather some ideas for, for the plans for the future. Um, however, I will do my best to share some knowledge with you, some insights on interesting issues we had to run into uh, in the process of setting up the project and while running it, in, running it uh, so far, including in particular copyright, which is going to be the first of those three parts into which I want to divide the session. The second being the features of the Wittgenstein project that make it unlike other similar projects that have already been uh, pursued in the field of philosophy and in particular translations. And then the last is going to be about the promises of technology, what we think we could do uh, thanks to the digital nature of this project. Um, so again, I will be starting from copyright and to illustrate some of the context uh, of the project. Feel free to raise your hands whenever you would like. So again, the first part is going to be uh, copyright and of course the relevance of it to the present and maybe more, most importantly, future availability of Wittgenstein's works. And the first subchapter of this first part of the talk is going to be focused on the purpose of copyright, uh, just to prevent some misunderstandings that tend to arise when this subject is addressed. Copyright uh, is essentially a device uh, that grants an author of a creative work monopoly over the distribution of such work. Uh, essentially copying, uh, hence the word, is not allowed without the permission of the author uh, or their representatives, uh, which of course must talk to the author first. And the... Um, Relevance of copying is, of course, related to the fact that uh, it has always been easier to breach intellectual property than other kinds of property. It's you know, just possible to make a copy of a book without diminishing the original, without perhaps the author to, even realizing that they have been, so to speak, robbed. Uh, and therefore, copyright as a subset of intellectual property 
is designed precisely to make this illegal, and then the enforcement of copyright is designed to prevent this from happening. This, in turn, is to uh, make sure that authors at least can uh, have a shot at making a living uh, out of their creative works because the permissions author grant others to reuse their works are usually granted for a fee, and that's how, at least in the best case scenario, the author of creative works uh, makes a living. The picture I put on the background here uh, is a depiction which I find very uh, attractive, very, very not attractive, of course, just, just very, very vivid, uh, of the pirate editor. It's from the uh, 60s or 70s of the 19th century, and that was an age in which uh, the circulation of books internationally was already very meaningful, but there was not yet an international agreement that prevented books from a given country from being resold in another without paying royalties to the original author. And there was, uh, well, lots of awareness of this issue, hence the uh, satirical pictures until the uh, Berne Convention solved the problem, 1886. Yes? Um, I do have a question because what if the monopoly of the decision of the author is consistent with the benefit of the public? That's the whole point. Thank you for the question. I'm going to address, th uh, to address this uh, all the time today. So I will go back to this in a moment. And yes, I, I will try to answer. If I don't, please raise your hand again and let's try to make this more specific. But yes, you're perfectly right. The point here is that Copyright was actually born with the purpose of striking a reasonable balance between the protection of the author's financial interest uh, and the public's right to access culture. Again, the, the, the very power of culture consists in the fact that duplicating books uh, can be done uh, indefinitely, uh, books of, or, or you know, other kinds of works of art, but uh, copying can be done indefinitely. There is no limitation of resources that prevents you from copying a book a billion times as opposed to 10 times, uh, at least in the age of print. So copyright is necessarily complemented by public domain. Public domain is the legal status of works that can be used, shared, distributed, remixed, and therefore built upon without restrictions of any kind, even without having to ask for permission and even less having to pay uh, to do so. So uh, it has always been the case that copyright has a, a finite duration. Uh, it used to be much shorter than it is today. Uh, in the early days of copyright, it was something like 10 or 20 uh, years uh, and, uh, after the death of the author. Uh, there has been a Cons, uh, con, um, consistent trend of extending the copyright term in the past century, in some countries more than in others. And the purpose of this is exactly to counterbalance the effect of copyright. Uh, so to ensure that the circulation of works is not forever subject to market laws. Usually, works fall in the public domain after a given time period. There can be exceptions to this. Uh, works can be born in the public domain. For example, in the United States, there is a very interesting uh, reasoning uh, that goes if a work has been done by someone who has been paid uh, to do that work by the state and therefore by the public, the work is born in the public domain. So everything uh, produced by uh, US officials in the exercise of their duties is in the public domain. And this actually includes, for example, NASA pictures, which are amazing and with huge educational value. Everything is in the public domain. But this is a digression. Uh, but yeah, actually, the, 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 say today, today is not the time and place to question the principle of copyright, uh, even though that might be interesting to do. The question is rather going to be, Considering that the purpose of copyright is precisely to find a compromise between the interest of the right owners and the public, is the current situation successful from that point of view? Are we happy with what is happening right now? And if we're not entirely happy, what is it that we can do to improve the situation to some extent? Uh, 
Of course, the reason why I gave you this introduction to copyright in general is because uh, we needed that to understand the copyright status of Wittgenstein's works. And let's briefly repeat what I already said uh, about general copyright rules, which we will then apply to Wittgenstein's works. By default, works are copyrighted. And by default means that there is no formality required, such as a registration, uh, in order for a work to be copyrighted. The moment it's created, it's copyrighted. The moment it's published, it can be proved that it is copyrighted. Uh, and all rights are reserved. Uh, the work cannot be distributed, copied, even less remixed without the author's consent. Or, of course, their representatives, as I mentioned before. Hairs, publishers, labels in the case of music, etc. Someone uh, the author has an agreement with. Copyright extends beyond the uh, author's death. Uh, death. Uh, today, in most countries, the duration of the copyright term is 50 or 70 years. In some places, it's less. In some places, it's up to 100 years. But this is true for, let's say, 95% of countries in the world. And all rights stay reserved. Of course, it's not the author who is in charge of them anymore, but the heirs. But copyright always expires. Uh, and when it does, no rights are reserved, uh, except for some moral rights which have to do with attribution and with not distorting the right. But this is actually something that has no financial import and which we will not be focusing very much today. It's essentially common sense. Uh, so that said, uh, why is it worth spending time talking about Wittgenstein's copyright? Isn't that straightforward? It isn't uh, for several reasons listed here. The first reason is that many countries have specific uh, special provisions for works that have been published posthumously. And because most of Wittgenstein's works have been published posthumously, uh, we have further uh, provisions to take into account in addition to the general 50 or 70 year rule. Additionally, Wittgenstein's works have been published in several different countries, uh, which is complicating the picture. Uh, we will talk about this more in a moment. And they have been extensive, I mean, because most of them have been published posthumously, all, uh, all, all, at, least, at least all those that have been published posthumously have been extensively edited, more or less extensively edited by editors. Uh, what you see here as a picture is a scan of Wittgenstein's last will in which he uh, elected uh, Ries and Scomb and von Ritt as his uh, literary executors and actually the owners of the rights on his uh, Nachlass. Not only the Nachlass, actually. The authorship issue uh, it should be discussed. So I'm starting from the last of the three bullet points in the slide before. What does it entail from the point of view of copyright that works have been edited? Uh, well, okay, this is the fact. They have been edited before being published. And what does it mean? It should be remembered, as I mentioned before, that the definition of copyright is uh, a form of protection for creative works, and the creative uh, qualification here is crucial because uh, copying uh, something verbatim is, uh, let's say, something which is generally speaking not considered uh, creative and therefore does not entail a uh, new, it does not entail, let's say, the generation the creation of a new layer of copyright. So a good example of uh, verbatim uh, copy or faithful reproduction is the scan of a piece of paper or other two-dimensional work of art or uh, document that's universally considered uh, not to be creative. Copying a text can also usually be considered not to be created even though, uh, of course, exceptions exist, the process of copying is the kind of thing that, as Wittgensteinians might say, looks very easy when you just think about it and then becomes very complicated when you look closely. Uh, so there is a continuum uh, of activities that might count as copying and it might turn out that some of them are not creative and that's a fact uh, that's, let's say, beyond uh, debate and some instances of copying might actually be argued to be creative. 
Uh, this is actually that something that we, we already talked about with some of the people in the room, and we will talk further about this, but it's really not something I want to focus on too much right now, even though we can focus on it during the discussion. Uh, the thing is, it's interesting now to understand whether or not the uh, work that the editors did on Wittgenstein's text can or cannot be considered creative. And what I really want to uh, make clear right now is that this is an issue. This is something uh, that needs to be discussed and uh, it's not a trivial question. I do have a proposal to answer it, uh, but I'm not sure it's the best proposal. It's the best I came up with so far. So the idea is that uh, Given that the activity that the author has performed can be summarized as selecting, grouping, and sorting remarks, uh, whereas the reproduction of the text has always been uh, very faithful to Wittgenstein's own writing, uh, whether this should be creative or not, should be considered creative or not. And what I propose here is just a very rough idea of the kind of continuum or spectrum I believe exists. Uh, the author's work, again, can be summarized as sorting, grouping, and, se and selecting, but different amounts of sorting, grouping, and selecting have been uh, performed in different instances, and also those activities have been, to some extent, qualitatively different based on, for example, how much Wittgenstein himself uh, hinted at a way of publishing a given set of remarks. And so what I did here is draw an arrow which points in the direction of more original uh, in terms of, again, the editor's work. So on our, uh, on, on, on our right is the more original and on our left is the less original. And just to give some examples, the philosophical investigations are a definite example of the editor's work being very much guided by what Wittgenstein himself did, whereas uh, other works as uh, uncertainty or their marks on color can be considered more uh, active, so to speak, from the point of view, there is more activity involved from the point of view of the editor, uh, even though, for example, as far as uncertainty is concerned, um, Anscombe in the preface writes explicitly that what she did uh, should not be considered a selection because Wittgenstein marked the remarks on certainty as part of an independent line of thought as opposed, uh, compared to the other remarks scattered uh, in the same manuscripts. Something similar is true for the remarks on color. And then again, very much to the right is culture and value, where what von, what von Ritt did was to actually take uh, remarks from very different periods uh, and do a definitely personal work of deciding what it made sense to print together. So again, I'm not going to say what is true here, but given that this is a problem, my stance and the stance that we agreed to take as a project is to consider uh, those works in which the editors themselves and uh, all evidence suggests to be non-creative as far as the editor is concerned again, uh, to be in the public domain because the original is, the original Wittgenstein writing is, and others not to be. And that's why on the Ludwig Wittgenstein projects, we currently have editions of the philosophical investigations, uncertainty, the remarks on color, but not of uh, culture and value. Please. Will you come back to the distinction between mechanical reproduction and following the instructions very closely? Because I do think there is a distinction between the two. Yes. Uh, well, actually, I wasn't planning to talk about that too much today. Uh, so if you would like, we can s stop for a moment and go about, no, about think, a bit deeper. I, I think it's an issue uh, to distinguish uh, mechanical reproduction from following instructions very closely. That the, the latter is not mechanical, I would say, but uh, maybe this is something we can then discuss later. Yes. Uh, we definitely can. Um, my, just to clarify my claim, uh, the idea is that, you know, of course, the fact that uh, a set of remarks are, have been written in the same notebook is not of itself uh, a strong reason to publish them all together. Mm. If the author put a very, uh, this is just a, 
uh, let's say, um, uh, counterfactual, but if the author put a very clear line at one point, that might be a strong indication of, uh, of him wanting the editors to publish what is before the line in a set and what is after the line in another. Uh, but again, yes, this is something that absolutely requires a case-by-case -case analysis. Yeah, maybe, maybe we could discuss to what extent for this by mechanical reproduction, something that can be performed by a machine. Why, for example, philosophical grammar, where Rashmi is closely followed with precise instructions, I think it could never have been produced by a machine. Yes, no, this is something I want to clarify. When I say mechanical, I do not mean that it could be performed by a machine. Uh, partly, as we discussed yesterday evening, because this is very uh, decade specific. So whether or not something is original does not depend on the current state of technology. What I say right now, uh, should have been valid in the 70s and should stay valid in the 2050s. Uh, but me by mechanical, by, by mechanical I, I mean something uh, that does not require decision, basically. I would also question your, your preference for coming up with the absolute definition of mechanical that is independent of the technical state of the art. Why, why would you want to do that? Uh, be, because, uh, because from the legal point of view, there is no difference between uh, copying a text uh, with a zeros machine and do it manually. Let's say the text is independent of the page setting and layout of the font you choose, the length of the line, etc. And therefore, if the focus is on the text, so the, the, the sequence of characters on the page, letters, numbers, and punctuation, then doing it with a machine or doing it manually is uh, absolutely the same. And from this point of view, what the uh, monks did in the Middle Ages and what we can do right now with a scanner is exactly the same. the word the term mechanical as far as I can tell uh, and I'm, I'm assuming there's a long draft uh, drafting history of, 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 of and I'm sure there were debates surrounding the term mechanical during the copyright debates when they were establishing all of this and we'd have to actually go back and take a look at what they were what they were thinking um, and then we'd have to follow the progression of how the copyright law had progressed since that time and I, I, I my, my suspicion is uh, the, the, that conversation is far and away from any normally associated with the term mechanical. <laughs> as, as Michele was just pointing out, the monks did the Middle Ages, and what we do today with scanners are legally the same thing, but worlds apart, uh, uh, practically and ordinarily speaking. I think that's, uh, is that a fair characterization? It is, definitely. Uh, let me try to make an example that I hope can clarify the issue a little bit before moving on. Um, there are some cases in which I am forced to interpret myself based on my knowledge of the legal landscape, and there are cases in which I'm not forced to do that because there is literature. So uh, there is a widely documented consensus among legal experts that frontal reproductions of paintings do not entail the creation of a new layer of copyright. If you would like, I will send you the links later. Um, so if I stand in front of a work of art by a living artist, uh, no, of course, I, that's a bad example. If I stand in front of a work of art by, uh, for example, I don't know, Leonardo, and I take a photo of it, which is, again, perfectly frontal, that counts as a mechanical reproduction. Not because I did that with a camera, which is a mechanical instrument, but because I put myself in the position from which no choice is possible any longer. If I take a picture of a three-dimensional work of art, for example, a statue, then I will always have choices to make, such as the angle, the framing, the composition, the lighting, the shutter speed, the focus, etc. And every reproduction of a three-dimensional work of art with a camera is not mechanical and copyrighted, regardless of the fact that it's a photograph as opposed to a painting itself, for example. So again, I hope this clarifies what I mean by mechanical in a legal sense. 
Should we move on? Uh, and then, of course, we can go back to this when, anytime we want. Another factor that makes uh, determining the copyright status of Wittgenstein's work complicated is a simple matter of geography, uh, because <laughs> according to the Berne Convention, which again was the first document and so far the last that disciplined what countries that are not the country of origin of a work should do to and with the works of a given author, uh, according to this convention, essentially each country uh, must grant foreign works the same protection it grants its own. Uh, this makes perfect sense. It solves the problem which we saw depicted in the satirical uh, image at the very beginning. But it can create uh, rather complex uh, scenarios because copyright laws are very much country specific and therefore it can easily happen, it happens all the time, that a work is copyrighted according to the rules of country X, but it is already in the public domain according to the rules of country Y. In the pre-digital age, this was only problematic to a limited extent, uh, because marketing a book in a new country required physically uh, printing it in another language, but not necessarily in another language, necessarily uh, at least exporting it, if not printing it, uh, beyond a given border and therefore having to comply with a clearly set uh, set of regulations, if you forgive this. Uh, in the digital age, for which the Berne Convention has not been updated and no other dedicated legislation has actually been passed at the international level, we do not know what we are supposed to do exactly. Uh, there have been several good practices uh, explored in the last decade and a half or two, and let's say, let's say two full decades. And uh, what we came up with, the best which so far uh, we've been able to do, is to do as follows. Okay, let's say, let's, let, me, let me be a little bit more clear about the constraints before. Uh, if you publish something on the internet, it is instantly available worldwide. Uh, therefore, it might be argued that you need to follow, to comply with the rules of every last country on earth, which is absolutely unreasonable uh, because as I mentioned before, the longest copyright term is 100 years old, uh, 100 years post-mortem of Taurus. Uh, it's the copyright term of Mexico. And at the same time, as we mentioned, the purpose of copyright and the public domain as two equally important parts of intellectual property law is to balance the interest of the public and the interest of the uh, owners of the rights. And therefore, it would make no sense for an Italian or a German or a South American uh, native or citizen or whatever not to be able to access something that is in the public domain in their country because it isn't in another one. So this is part of the problem. The other part of the problem uh, is that then what is it that we must comply with? And what has again been agreed upon as a best practice is to always make sure that a given work uh, that is published on the internet is in the public domain, first of all, in its country of origin, and second of all, in the country where the website and the uploader are based. Um, of course, this does not mean that the work is uh, legally online everywhere in the world. Uh, and our example as the Wittgenstein project are perfectly relevant here. Um, we are based in Italy. Luckily, Italy is very representative of the European state of things. So laws that apply in Italy are very similar, except for a few exceptions, but very, very few really, to laws that apply in the rest of Europe and really many other countries of the world. And therefore, what is legal here is also legal pretty much everywhere in Europe as well as in many other countries. Um, and in the country of origin of the work. So essentially, this is not a rule, but it's the best, best practice that we have. Sure. Uh, when you say best practice, does that mean best practice from a legal standpoint or just from some sort of uh, from the perspective of politeness, because from a legal standpoint, it wasn't very clear to me why the country of origin would be relevant here. Do I not, as somebody who uploads something, only have to comply with the laws of the country?
country where I'm based and where my server is in this particular scenario? Yes, well, you're right. If have to means I'm legally obliged to do, that's correct, because you're only supposed to comply to the rules of your country, even though, okay, this does not happen, obviously, but you might technically end up prosecuted in another country if you go there, I believe, uh, which would not be pleasant. Um, but let's say the, the, the thing is, I mentioned that we cannot comply with Mexican rules. Uh, Mexico could still prevent access to our website within its territory. That's something governments have the power to do. And that would be fair from their point of view. Uh, so this is something which, okay, doesn't really answer your question, but it's probably useful to add to the picture. And uh, again, it, it stays true that the internet is international. Uh, only complying by the rules of our own backyard would be, again, not something we would be prosecuted for, uh, but it is a bit inconsistent with the obvious understanding that the internet uh, is without boundaries. Uh, so really, uh, the country of origin is, uh, has been identified as the other parameters that was uh, relevant uh, from, this, from this point of view. Uh, again, this is not a rule, so um, you, you, you would not be prosecuted if you, you know, uploaded something that is in public domain in your country and not in most others. Uh, but let's say uh, the, 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 the double criterion, which you can see in the slide right now, uh, looks to me and again to the, for example, to the open, so open knowledge community, the Wikimedia project comply with this rule uh, to be the, the most reasonable. Also the, the one that is mo the most consistent with the spirit of the laws, because you know, when a law is a century old plus and you have no updates, uh, complying to the letter becomes difficult if not impossible, but still you can try to comply with the spirit. Yeah, there's also a question for clarification. Yes. No, it published. Published. But if it has not been like in the good case, it has not been So if he got parts in Norway, then maybe the law is different than when he has written it in the UK. Luckily, this is an easy question. The definition of country of origin is uh, written down uh, in the Berne Convention, and it is the country the work has been published the first time, uh, regardless of the author's nationality, regardless of where the work has been written. It can happen, sorry, just a very quick precision. Uh, it can happen that a work is published uh, simultaneously in multiple countries, and there the definition of simultaneous publication in the Berne Convention is within 30 days. But it still has only to do with where the work becomes publicly available for the first time. So if you think that from Richard's work and the culture of values itself create this work, then Finland would also be a country of religion? Uh, no, no, no. The nationality of the author or editor, if the editor is creative, is irrelevant. Uh, it's about the publication of the book. So I honestly I don't remember which one was the first edition, whether it was bilingual or not, but the place it was published, maybe Britain, uh, is the country of origin. But so in the case of the Atlas, would that mean that, um, uh, I mean, the Blackwell editions were parts of the Atlas were the first, right? But also the full country of Valley, it was so kind of finished at the map. Yeah. Okay, but. In the other cases, the, the black books become double published, where they publish at the same time. Or so, what is the country of origin for those works then? Is it the UK or is it Germany? Or uh, I, I have this in a slide in a moment. I think we can so, I think we can see it. Uh, at this point, I don't remember exactly in what order my slides are, but we have it. Again, I don't understand. If for me is granted to have contributed a second layer of creativity to capture and It's still the, uh, the country of origin is still the country of the publication. Yes, yes, yes. If I, if I write an essay that 
purely and simple has two authors. If I co-author an essay with Frederick and we publish it in uh, Mexico, then it will stay copyrighted for 100 years after The Last of Us dies. This is just a very quick picture of the current situation throughout the world. Uh, we're not going to focus on this too much, but before I mention, yes. One remark, uh, we heard from the chat that it's very hard to hear the questions. You're right, apologies. It's very brief. Uh, I will do my best to remember to always repeat the question, I apologize. Um, again, this is just a very, uh, I mean, it's a nice picture that uh, exemplifies the current situation. I mentioned before that Italy is kind of representative of many other countries. As you can see, we are right there in orange. Orange countries have a 70-year-old, uh, a 70-year post-mortem actoris copyright term. Yellow countries, which as you can see is the majority of the rest, have 50 years as the copyright term. There are a few with a longer term, such as again Mexico, which is dark gray there, uh, and some intermediate cases such as India with 60 years, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The United States have different rules. The reason why they had 70 in the picture before is that right now, anything that is published by a single author uh, not working for a corporation will become public domain 70 years after the death of that person. But the situation in the past was very different. It changed many times in ways that were sometimes retroactive. And this makes for an incredibly complex situation, which is very briefly summarized in this oversimplified uh, table you can see here, whereby I mean, even if you can't read, you can see it's complicated. That's more than enough from my point of view right now. Uh, the thing is that in the United States, in most cases, the year of publication is relevant, which it isn't in Europe because only the death of the author is relevant. Uh, the year of the death of the author is relevant. Uh, often, whether or not the authors have complied with formalities is relevant. It, it, there, there used to be a uh, the, the, see, uh, the, there used to be a time in the United States where you had to register your work or at least put a copyright notice on it in order for it to be copyrighted. And if you failed to just put you know, the sign C with a circle around it and the date on your manuscript or even film, then that would be instantly released in the public domain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this is interesting uh, and important to some extent because uh, the United States are undoubtedly the center of gravity of the internet as of today, also because, of course, English is the lingua franca of the contemporary age. And um, it very often happens for any kind of project that deals with uh, open culture to have to comply with rules uh, that are the American rules and the rules where the uploader or contributor is based. Uh, again, this is not very relevant for the Wittgenstein project, uh, but it is for Wikimedia projects that are based in the United States and where therefore everything that is uploaded must be compliant with the rules uh, of the uh, uploader, the rules of the country of origin, and in that case, uh, because the uploader and the website are not in the same country, also the rules of the, uh, let's say, location where either the servers are based or more relevant, the owner of the site is incorporated. The copyright term, as far as Wittgenstein is concerned, is only relevant in a few countries. Actually, this is the list of countries in which some of it, one or another among Wittgenstein's works were published for the first time. Uh, in the next slide, I have part of the answer to your previous question. This is a short, short table uh, that actually uh, only um, deals with the works that we have published with on the on the project, but it gives you like a very very simple outline of how um, many works, uh, how each work may have a different country of origin. Uh, this is really just the country the work was published for the first time. So you see, we have the United Kingdom, the United States, because for example, some works appeared in a in a journal. Uh, 
shortly, be, shortly after Wittgenstein's death, Germany for the Surkamp editions, Austria for both the original edition and the uh, Gleitwort of the uh, dictionary for elementary schools. Then, as you see, we have the United States, the Netherlands, because the journal in which the Bemerkungen und Befalzes, Goldenbau, were published in a Dutch uh, journal in the uh, 60s. Many are the Blackwell editions, and therefore they have the United Kingdom as the country of origin. A few have the United States. And actually, those last two are interesting because uh, those two works, uh, of course, appeared as uh, book editions. I believe both of them, the Bemerkungen bei Farben and Übergewissheit, as Blackwell editions. Um, but this happened after they had already been published in the Cornell edition in the United States. Uh, and therefore they do have 1968 as their year of publication and the United States as their country of origin. And therefore those are the terms, the copyright terms that can be relevant uh, for Wittgenstein uh, as far as the uh, country of origin is concerned. 70 years for all of the ones listed in the slide, except for the United States, where this is variable and again depends on several other factors, and then Italy, but that's more or less the same as saying the United States uh, as far as the location of the uploaders and the hosting of the service of the, of the, of the website is concerned. Two of those lines have an asterisk uh, because in the Netherlands and in the United Kingdom there are uh, specific provisions for posthumously published works, uh, which, however, do not uh, affect the works published. I mean, those specific words, works by Wittgenstein. I will give you an example of one of those specific provisions in a moment. Is it always easy to establish the first place of publication at the first place of publication? And what was one do if, if in the publication it states, for example, 1921, like well, that's the kind of context in which legal experts would ask subject matter experts. So uh, what I did was uh, use uh, the sources that I had at my disposal. So actually... The question, so I mean, how does one establish the exact publication date? Uh, let's say in most cases, whatever is printed on the book is relevant, you know, it's something you can show in a tribunal. But then if there is a widespread consensus among the experts that what is written on the book cover or actually in the uh, imprint is incorrect, then that's going something, I mean, at that point it's going to be a tribunal if we ever end up in court to decide which one is the most reliable. Yeah, but uh, if we know that the imprint date is not the date of the actual publication, like in the case of the notion of software, Yes. What is then the publication date? I would believe the tribunal would listen to the experts in that case and would not trust the imprint. So Again, it's, uh, it's, it's the actual date of publication which counts, not the imprint. I should say, this is a difficult question, I'm not entirely sure. I should say the real date counts uh, because no formalities are required for copyright to uh, hold uh, except in the United States for a very short period. So uh, it's a matter of uh, substance and not form, I believe. But also I believe that those kinds of mistakes generally are, they probably have limited impact in most cases. It must be a mistake of one year, not more. Uh, but yeah, about this, about this, uh, I didn't know. So, so the actual German edition did not come out in 1921. Okay, thank you. I will correct this one. Um, luckily, it does not have any impact on the copyright status. All right. I mentioned that some countries have specific provisions for uh, works that have been published posthumously. And uh, this is the case with the UK. 
And I, of course, don't want to go into the details of this one, but I just want you to have an idea about the process that goes into determining the copyright status of a work. In some cases, knowing the death of the, the date in which the author died is more than sufficient. In some others, it isn't. And in that kind of uh, scenario, you really have to dive into an algorithmic way of thinking. And if you're lucky, you find a very nice flowchart such as this one, uh, published under an open license by the National Archi Archives of the United Kingdom. And you basically follow through the flowchart. So is the author known? Yes. Is the work a literally dramatic or musical work, a photograph, etc.? Yes. Is the work a photograph, a photograph taken before the 1st of June 1957? No. Was the work published before the 1st of August 1989? Yes, for most, but not all, of Wittgenstein's works. Did the author die more than 20 years before publication? In the case, for example, of the philosophical investigation, no, he didn't. And so the copyright expires 50 years after the first publications. In another case, uh, the copyright might expire 70 years after the death of the author. So this is the kind of complication we deal with uh, on a daily basis. This is just, let's say, the output of this kind of thinking as far as the works by Wittgenstein that have appeared on our website are concerned. So again, we did not publish works that we fear might have an editor who counts as a co-author, even, even, even if we don't consider ourselves sure that some editing jobs can count as co-authoring jobs. We were cautious on that front. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is the, the result. And well, actually, uh, I will go back for a second because there is a question. And actually, this concludes the first part. Uh, we talked, I, I talked uh, for a short, slightly longer time than I expected, but that was actually expected. Please, Alois. One question is why are the grammatical and the phrases the word bow in the public domain? Because I would think the, the level of creative work invested by Rashmi's qualifies his work as creative as such. And another question is why are the intellectual ethics in the public domain? It is true that they have published the TypeScript and the Cambridge version manuscript under a CC license, but does that now mean that the entire work is in the public domain? Like, does that mean that the Austin National Library manuscript is also in the public domain? Okay, let me answer in order. Uh, the first question, I know the answer. The second, I don't think so. Um, as to the remarks on Fraser, um, you're perfectly right. That's one of the cases in which I believe Rush Riz at least might count as creative. Also, it's one of the cases in which the editor works has been judged the most uh, criticizable. There's a better word for this, but people have said that in that case, the author's job was not as good as it could have been. So we elected to publish that work in a way that is uh, unedited, so to speak. So instead of publishing the Reese edition, we uh, used the WAB tool to publish something that is essentially identical to the diplomatic version. But, but on what basis, if, if Rush Reese's selection qualifies his work as creative, on what basis can one then take our transcriptions and publish those, if the work itself of the selection is already created? Well, uh, let's say one thing is the selection and one thing is the editing. I mean, uh, of course, no, actually, actually, sorry. Uh, the, the, the selection can be considered part of the editing process, but then there is a work on the text. Uh, for example, the process of transforming manually uh, a diplomatic edition into something that is more than linear edition. It's really just a reader-friendly edition with no uh, additional punctuation, etc. Uh, that's what Rush Riz did for publication in uh, Synthese, I believe. Uh, and this is one of the cases in which the selection part, in our opinion, could count as not creative because the, 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 the well, some remarks that are referenced to the page number in uh, Fraser's book are obviously uh, grouped together by the very fact that they do so. 
and some other that don't uh, can still be considered to stand out on their own. So uh, again, this is a matter of uh, interpretation indeed. I, I do believe that what I say could be argued against, but again, in that continuum which I talked about before, we thought that the, again, uh, selection process could be considered not creative. Just another example, I mentioned before the preface that Antcombe wrote for uncertainty. Uh, there is a similar preface for the remarks on color in which the reason for grouping those uh, remarks together and publishing them together is explained. And to our, let's say, from our point of view, that uh, would also make the work count as not creative. Um, so as, in these cases, it's really a, a, a work based on Wittgenstein expertise and uh, different um, voices may have different opinions. And again, I really truly hope this not, does not happen, but if a serious conflict ever were to arise, what would happen? I really hope this stays a counterfactual, but if we ended up in court, uh, what the tribunal would do would just be to listen to the experts and try to determine who's right. And the second question. The yes. Uh, so the lecture on ethics. Let me go to my notes because I don't know, uh, Frederick. Here you should share. If we go too much into uh, technical details, we may want to go on uh, on this over lunch. But I really want to try to answer your question sooner or later. I think it's still fine. I'm just trying to. Um the questions in the chat, but uh, I mean... I forgot to repeat the question yeah, again. That's, that's fine, but I think we still have time for a few questions. And of course, it also depends on whether you want to cut a bit of time in, your, uh, in the later parts to make more room for the questions now, which would be fine for me. I think the, the lecture on ethics is a nice case for discussion because what has been published by us under Creative Commons license is the TypeScript version and one manuscript version, but there's still another manuscript version which has not been published under the Creative Commons license. And the question is whether the work, what is called the work, is under the Creative Commons license. Yes. This is precisely the kind of case that ends up in court, right? <laughs> I think this is, this is, I think the only of course the question is to ask, okay, uh, if you were to translate this thing, which version would, uh, uh, which version would you be translating? And the, uh, in the case of the Wittgenstein project, um, the, the version that uh, is, is published here, as far as I understand, is under creative uh, commons license. That's the, the that, that specific one is here. So there's not a broader question of what counts as the work in general, but which version of the work is the public domain. And as long as you stay with, you use those versions that are under those licenses, you don't deviate, right? So I always say there's a, there's a deviation um, uh, in, in the lecture ethics where he says, um, uh, my my main point, and that's the later manuscript, and then the, the Creative Commons version, he says, is the point, my, 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 my thought. And so, which version is in, uh, on the, the, the website of the, the, the Wittgenstein project? It doesn't say my main point, it says my point, right? And it's a particular version of the work that happens to be the Creative Commons license. So, if we have, we have identifiable, uh, we have identifiable uh, points where we can say, this version is under Creative Commons, and look at our text, we didn't use. The other, uh, the other versions from the later, the, 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 the later versions of those sentences in, uh, in the publication here. And in other words, the text that has been published by the Ludwig Wittgenstein uh, project sh um, should, um, and my review of it was uh, translated into German, that was one of the things I did as a translator first, was to look to make sure that it was a Creative Commons, like, uh, or a Creative Commons version that was here. Now, I'm not a lawyer, I can't um, say yes or no, but the idea that there's a that particular versions of the work as opposed to the work itself are in the public domain and because there's identifiable differences between the different versions. Um, you may want to, it's an interesting editorial question, you may want to point out in a footnote, hey, in the later version, he doesn't say my point, he says my main point. Um, but that's a that's editorial work, not um, that's not a copyright question. 
but, but as it is raised here, it means that you can republish uh, the, the version of the election ethics as published in philosophical locations, right? Uh, which is different than the one that was published standalone? It, it says that the election ethics is in the public domain. So you can just copy uh, the, the pages in philosophical locations which are... I am the report. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm very fine with, with, with you republishing our, our CC publication, of course, but the, as it is raised here, you can republish Clarkes. Yes, yes, yes. In principle, yes. Uh, just one other thing. But he's not the author. No. He's no say. <laughs> so I just, that was just my question. I mean, whether this is really what you want to say. I think, um, may I? Sure. I, 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 I find the interesting your problem. I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, and then in, in the, in, in, with the case of, of Wittgenstein, there's different versions of, 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 a, of a work. So if we say, and in lecture and ethics, as you said, is a prime example, there's different versions of the lecture and ethics. There's three or four different manuscripts, uh, I, I think, or typescripts, um, if I remember. One typescript, two manuscripts. One, one typescript, two, two manuscripts of, of the lecture and ethics. So are all of the, so, so the question is, when, you, when, when the Ludwig Wittgenstein project said the lecture and ethics is in the public domain, are they saying all of those versions are in the public domain, or are they saying only certain versions of, of the lecture and ethics, or uh, certain um, embodiments uh, are in the public domain? Yeah, put this way, the question is very clear. Put in this way, the question is very clear, and I will try to summarize it for the people on Zoom. Uh, I mean, one time I will remember. Um, so uh, Peter is proposing a uh, summary of uh, a rewording of, of what we have been saying about lecture and ethics. Uh, and the, the, the essence of the question, I believe, is uh, which version uh, of the lecture and ethics should count as having been published under Creative Commons or being in the public domain in other countries. Uh, so my answer there is the question boils down to whether those versions are different enough from each other to count as different works. Uh, I will give a borderline provocative example for which I hope you will forgive me, but clearly copying a text with typos does not generate a new layer of copyright. So the second text, the one with typos, is different than the first because it's got typos, maybe 10 over 100 pages. It's not a new work. Uh, even if the modifications are intentional, 10 small additions or deletions of an article are not going to make the second work different than the first. Uh, in, a, in every specific case, it can and should be argued whether the differences are meaningful enough to make the works count as different. But in this case, uh, we argue, we would argue, I would argue, they aren't. Um, the first thing I want to ask is about the, the copyright status of the Nahas as a whole. Um, so, based on your flow chart uh, regarding the law in the UK, I mean, we know that Trinity College is of the opinion that at least in the UK it's still under copyright. Um, but I mean, based on the Cornell edition at least, um, can you go back to the flow chart because I don't. Um, yes, there, I mean, it does depend on. Uh, whether the work was published before August 1st, 1989, the Cornell edition was before that, right? Nice. And so in that case, um, shouldn't something entirely different apply in this case, contrary to what Jonathan Smith, for example, says regarding the 2039 date? The issue of the copyright status of the Nachlas is very complex. Uh, the Wittgenstein project focuses on works that have appeared as books for reasons unrelated to the complications of the Nachlas copyright status, and that is essentially the audience we elected to be uh, focusing on. Uh, but um, it made our life easier. Uh, the problem with the Nachlas is that, for example, if a part of the Nachlas uh, does not differ enough from something that has been published as a book to count as a different work, 
then that part of the Nakhlas is or is not in the public domain, depending on whether the published book version is or is not in the public domain. So you would have to split up the Nakhlas by you know, seeing in what way those remarks have been published uh, the first time in order to ascertain whether those parts are or are not in the public domain in a given country. Uh, as to the rest, uh, as to those parts of the Nahlas that have not been published as standalone books or short, uh, for example, texts such as the actual ethics in a journal, etc., um, then I would say the Kunal edition counts as the fair publication. Uh, I mean, it definitely does. In that case, the country of origin is the, is the United States. Uh, and because that work was published without a copyright notice, it's in the public domain. Its contents are in the public domain. This again is an issue that is almost certain whether or not there is a public domain, uh, sorry, whether or not there is a uh, copyright notice on the Cornell edition volumes, uh, and this is crucial to whether or not this is in the public domain in the United States, uh, is something we have done our best to ascertain, and so far we haven't found the copyright notice. But of course, not finding something is not enough to say it's not there, uh, as opposed to finding something being enough to say that it is there. And uh, so uh, it might happen that someone can disprove us, but we've been looking. We have papers that state that there is no imprint on those books, and if there is a copyright notice, it's in the imprint, and so we have an argument. So if someone wanted to argue against us, the burden of proof would be on, on their side. Uh, but then again, if I am right in saying that there is no copyright notice in the Cornell edition, because it was published in 68, and 68 falls within that period in which uh, you had to put that kind of notice for the edition to be uh, copyrighted in the United States, then the Cornell edition is in the public domain in the United States, that is its country of origin. In other countries, for example, European countries, the only other criterion, the only criterion would be the author's uh, year of death, which has been, uh, which is more than 70 years ago, so you would be fine. Uh, is it absolutely established that the copy is to count as a publication? Yes. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, the United States uh, have a clear definition of publication in their uh, codes, uh, in one of the laws, written laws, of course, and um, the Cornell edition falls under that because it was initially available for purchase. Even though few copies were made, people could write to the uh, Cornell University and have their copy of some or another part. The, the fact that it was just a few copies or that it had no imprint or even more ISBN code, which didn't, I believe, exist at the time, etc., that is not relevant to the definition of publication in the United States. Um, so just to clarify, does that mean that um, regarding all those previously unpublished parts which were for the first time published in the Cornell edition, it would now be possible to freely share the facsimiles that were scanned by Trinity College because the scans do not count as a great work and thus can be shared freely because the scans are in the public domain as well. Definitely. In this case, it is the answer that, had, that needs to be repeated, uh, definitely. Um, there was something I wanted to add, but I forget. So, no, yes, the only thing is that the Cornell edition does not include all of the Nakhles. Am I right? So those parts that were not in the Cornell edition, I believe some of them have actually been published after 1989. Uh, uh, it, include all of the parts and a lot of the stuff is covered, so I have to say, I'm going to hang back with you, of course, not included in the Cornell But if, if it is the case, if it is the case, if it is the case that the Cornell copy 
always to count as uh, the fabrication of those materials that are made available there, on what basis uh, have libraries uh, uh, reserved all rights in the distribution of the images? of the original holdings. I think there must be a different view on the status of the collateral. Uh, I would love to hear the argument of Trinity here. Uh, what I can tell you Trinity is... Trinity is the one who offers everything Creative Commons in terms of facsimile. Sorry, yes. Uh, 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 sorry, my mistake here. Uh, but, but okay, I mean, um, what I can tell you is that um, there is a very widespread tendency to anyone who owns an original or claims any kind of responsibility as to the destiny of uh, corpus uh, to put copyright signs everywhere. Uh, it's very common for museums that own very old art to put copyright signs on the postcards that they sell in the bookshop, even though the reproduction is as faithful as it gets, which is absolutely unwarranted. And that definitely counts, if you forgive the neologism, as public domain breach, which is, of course, coined in analogy with copyright breach. But if it is true that the public domain is as important a feature of copyright law as uh, copyright, and it is, and if it is true that those works are in the public domain, and it is, uh, and again, if copyright is meant to protect both the public and the authors, and not only the authors, then putting a copyright sign where it does not belong is illegal. It's obvious that those who do are not prosecuted for power reasons, but I would, I'm, not, I'm never surprised when I see a copyright sign where it does not belong. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, let's move on, but so far this has been very interesting, at least for me. Um, the, the, the second and third part of the conversation, which are really meant to be very much uh, connected to each other, and so it's kind of okay if we compress them in the 45 minutes that are left, uh, deal with a more uh, specific description of the Ludwig Wittgenstein project's goals, which also covers uh, the extent to which it differs from similar endeavors that have already been started in the past, and with the things which we would like to do in the future, especially in technical terms. So the purpose uh, of the Ludwig Wittgenstein project, its goals are uh, to uh, essentially, well, that's the mission and vision statement, make Wittgenstein's writings that were previously published in book form more readily available to the public. And our focus is actually not academics. We want to work with academics and experts as much as possible. And that's one of the reasons why I'm happy to be here. Uh, but the target audience of the project is complementary to the target audience of the WAB sites. Uh, we aim at catching the attention of uh, newcomers, students, people who might have an expertise in philosophy but no expertise in Wittgenstein yet. Um, anyone who has heard of the Tractatus and would like to read and you know, experience in the first person how those passages about silence sound and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the digital form makes this very easy. It also grants us possibility to make the same text accessible to, I mean, accessible in a more technical sense uh, to people who cannot see. Uh, the, the digital nature of the uh, Wittgenstein Project editions are uh, accessible to screen readers. And in a few cases, actually in one case, but we hope to expand that, we also have an ebook available, uh, uh, an audiobook available, I apologize. And uh, still, the source files may be uh, interesting. Of course, uh, we are talking about a source file that reproduces a book's uh, text and formatting, so nothing like the XML files of the University of Bergen Wittgenstein archives. But still, 
a very clean, plain text edition, uh, or at least source file, uh, with markup that tells the machine rather than the user about emphasis, line breaks, paragraph numbers, formulae, etc., can be pretty useful, not for the general public in this case, but for example, for people such as Sasha and Laura who are looking to uh, focus on Wittgenstein's published books, such as the Tractatus or the Philosophical Investigation, and make them into hypertexts or annotated texts or uh, simply editions that expand the features of a regular book. Our reasons for wanting to, so to speak, enforce the public domain, like others enforce uh, copyright, is that public domain infringement exists. And we really would like to make sure that what is in the public domain is not only so in theory, but also in practice. That public domain is being eroded, and this is something we would like people to be more aware of. I mentioned the trend of uh, copyright terms becoming longer and longer. This is what we call copyright, uh, sorry, uh, public domain erosion. So. Uh, it becomes legal for rights holders, rights owners, to uh, restrict the public's domain, the public domains uh, extend uh, year after year, and this is something we want people to be aware of and hopefully oppose. Um, we do have a vision uh, similar to the one that um, characterizes the Wikimedia project, projects that the internet was always meant uh, to be a public library, uh, and even though it looks less and less so, uh, there are some sanctuaries of this idea uh, still out there, such as the Internet Archive, uh, the Gutenberg Project, the Wikimedia Projects, of course, places where you can find educational resources of good quality, sometimes excellent quality, without having to put up with uh, membership fees or even worse, advertisements. So we, that's what we want to be. And there is one last argument which I believe is relevant. Uh, the period uh, during which a, a work stays copyrighted after an author dies can be a resource for the uh, heirs who can go on exploiting the work financially or works, of course. It is also meant to be a way in which hairs keep on having a say on the quality of edition, editions. So again, uh, copyright is very relevant from the financial point of view, but it is not only relevant from the financial point of view. It might or might not, but it definitely might make sense that uh, the inherited ownership of the rights is connected to the right to control what can be done with a book in terms of editions, translations, etc. I say it might not have sense because the heirs are not necessarily most qualified, the most qualified people to have a say in those matters uh, regardless. We know that uh, works stay copyrighted for decades after the author dies. Um, this can be a good thing, at least for the heirs, it might be a tragic thing for the book because if the public loses interest in a book, uh, and then of course at that point there is also no reason for the hairs to keep it copyrighted, but nobody thinks of releasing it into a public, uh, let's say an open license for example. Well, in that case, when the book goes out of print, it quite literally can fall into oblivion. Uh, all books are destined to have a new life after the copyright term expires, but not all books make it to the moment when copyright expires. And this is, again, something I believe is tragic and something we would like to do, some purpose which we would like to serve is allowing translators who, for example, have translated Wittgenstein uh, in the last decades to put their editions, to their translations online if they fear that the uh, print edition might disappear uh, or if they would like to and can do so because they have such an agreement with the publishers that allows this to be done. There are precedents to what we're doing. Uh, 
for example, um, well, there are uh, sites that contain Nietzsche's originals, Kant's originals. One of the websites that actually inspired uh, the creation of the Ludwig Wittgenstein project was a very nice project called the Open Commons of Phenomenology, which deals with works by Husserl and others in the phenomenological tradition. And the idea of uh, putting Wittgenstein's works online when they entered the public domain was kind of natural. Uh, it was really easy to have that idea. Actually, uh, I expected others to come up with the same idea and six or seven Wittgenstein projects to pop up at the same time on the 1st of January this year. Uh, and also, um, even though, even if this didn't happen, um, I mean, even though, even if this hadn't happened, sorry, uh, individual books, PDFs, stuff would have been uploaded to the internet in a scattered way with no systematic uh, search engine, for example, with no consistency in editorial practices, layout, downloadability, etc. So let's say in the very worst case scenario, what we can do is to provide a single point of access to people who want to share things that are in the public domain and that others may have uh, may own or, or just the others may have the, the, the source files in an uploadable way. So in, in this way, our goals are, are kind of obvious, are really something that anyone could have come up with. There is, however, one respect in which uh, the Wittgenstein project differs from similar projects, such as the ones I mentioned, and that is the uh, translations. And this is what I would like to focus on right now. This project was born multilingual for one very simple reason. Wittgenstein's own originals are written in two languages. And uh, in addition to that, which is of course the first and most important point perhaps, some translations were already available. Uh, tragically, Ramsey died very young, uh, many years before Wittgenstein himself, himself, and from the point of view of copyright, that means that as soon as the uh, original work is uh, in the public domain, the further layer, which in one way has already expired, also becomes freely reusable. So when we started thinking about the site, it was already clear that we would have at least two languages. And then uh, we knew that uh, translations were available in other languages that their authors would have liked to put online for free under a Creative Commons license. And why not expand that even further? Uh, okay, the last point I already made before. This is the point I already made before. Uh, so in, in some way, uh, we did want to make translations available. And then it occurred to me that this was not only cool, but also uh, right in one uh, specific way. And what I would like to do here in the next five minutes is to please ask you to focus on the kind of subject we are not very used to uh, thinking about as uh, people who work in the field of ideas, but there are some very practical, uh, practical and uh, trivial uh, financial issues that have huge impact on the availability of books in general. Um, I would like to propose uh, 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 to, to, to point out a difference to you, which then we will see uh, is the reason, the fact that this difference exists is the reason for us to want to translate uh, books and make the translations available online under a free license for free and under a free license. This is a flow chart, uh, sorry, a, a, a cash flow uh, chart that represents what happens when a new book, for example, a novel or an essay, let's imagine one of those essays that actually sell copies, is published. The horizontal axis is time and the uh, vertical axis is the cash inflow and outflow. You don't see my... Uh, cursor, so I will put it here. Uh, 
Over time, what can be said to happen in a simplified case uh, is that the author has the book, the book is edited, etc. The um, publisher invests in uh, the editing process, typographical fees, the author stands down payment, and this darker line represents the money that the publisher spends at first, that's why it's below zero, and then starts making, uh, this is the moment the book is published, that's the moment the uh, publisher starts making money, and hopefully this goes in the green area uh, of, the, of the chart, so to speak. Uh, as to the author, they get a down payment, hopefully, at the very beginning. Uh, if they don't, they will start getting the money a bit later when the book starts selling. Uh, and in the case of uh, new book, new books, uh, original works, whether they are fiction or non-fiction, what typically happens is that authors uh, get paid uh, with a down payment and royalties. Uh, and uh, with lump sum and royalties. And there, that's why you can see that the sales, uh, the, not the sales, but the total, in, uh, the total sum the publisher has earned through sales uh, constantly grows, even though at some point it's bound to slow down in typical cases. And the author's share also grows because it's connected, it's linked to a percentage of the uh, sales. What I would like to focus the most is actually just this fact, this fact that the author's line has a positive gradient uh, throughout the uh, chart. In the case of translations, uh, it might happen that um, translators are paid through royalties as well. This is a case which I will cover slightly afterwards, but the situation uh, at least in Italy, let's, let me focus on, for example, a, a country-specific example. This is what happens. From the point of view of the publisher, uh, the situation is similar. Uh, first of all, they spend money to uh, choose the translator, to manage the background processes that they have to manage. Of course, at some point, they will have to set up the book, uh, to, 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 to page set, to, to fix the layout of the book, to print it, etc. And so they will go below zero here. They will start making money, they will hopefully break even. Please note that in the case of classics, it's particularly difficult not to break even. And that's also why the curve doesn't really go down much, because if you make a good edition, uh, you're going to be able to print many, many, uh, uh, let's say, batches uh, for, for potentially years and in some cases decades. However, uh, the author uh, often only gets, sorry, the, 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 sorry, this is my mistake. The, this is the translator's uh, down payment. The author of the translation's down payment uh, happens at some time before or after, or maybe in tranches uh, in the process of the translating. And uh, in, the, in the scenario where the uh, translator does not uh, get paid through royalties as well, the line stays flat. So if they get 10,000, that's it, once and for all. Of course, it is possible for translators who translate classics to be uh, retributed also with royalties, but uh, I'm told this often happens when the lump sum payment at the beginning is very low, and essentially the entrepreneurial risk is shared between the uh, publisher and the translator. Our idea is that instead of uh, sharing the entrepreneurial risk uh, between the publisher and the translator with that sort of uh, combination of a tiny lump sum payment and, uh, uh, let's say, uh, royalty payment spread over a period of time, it could probably be at least as fair, if not fairer, to always publish, always pay the translator a very reasonable uh, lump sum payment. And then because in most cases they would anyway not make much money uh, afterwards, uh, just make sure that the translation is freely available. Uh, what interests me here is the uh, fact that the darker line is uh, not only the amount of money the publisher makes, but also the amount of money that flows out of the pockets of the public. 
So essentially, the idea there is that after they broke even as far as the translator's fee is concerned, publishers will keep profiting from a translation forever. From the point of view of the public, it would be much reasonable to get organized in such a way as the translator is only paid once, a good amount of money, and then everybody else can read the translation for free. Uh, this is something that is actually becoming quite common, or at least more common, in the field of uh, academic articles. There are companies, uh, such as the German um, Knowledge Unlatched, that have this very business model. They uh, gather money from university libraries and other entities of that kind that are used to paying yearly fees to publishers uh, for access to the research articles. And instead of using that money to let them access a website, uh, a publisher's archive for a year, they use that money to release, uh, to, to, to pay researchers to release their research uh, under open access. In that way, uh, they break this sort of uh, rental cycle. Uh, they ensure the public has ownership of the uh, content, and the cash flow is much more reasonable uh, because uh, the, the, the job is paid for. It definitely is and should be. But then there is no tax for the public to be paid to the publisher, who at that point does really not do much for the uh, progress of the human spirit. This is just the justification for wanting to you know, put a difference under your eyes. Uh, sometimes we don't, th don't see things, sometimes we don't care about them, uh, because again, financial matters are uninteresting. Uh, but when we see them, it's difficult to unsee them, and maybe it's a good thing. Uh, so, the business logic of a new book and the translation of a classic is profoundly different, and there does exist a different model. Uh, again, this is what I was talking about right now. A so-called, so it's not called that way, it's just my uh, periphrasis, which I think is clear enough. Uh, fundraising for open access. Uh, you get the public, uh, directly or through institutions, to pay uh, researchers to uh, publish their work under open access, and then uh, you make sure that there is no uh, parasitic tax, tax on the reading of those articles on the part of the publisher. This is what we want to do, basically. We want to apply the same model to new translations of classics as opposed to research papers only. So, what we have done so far is we relied heavily on voluntary work for the organization part of the project and for the web development part of the project. Uh, we have not discouraged voluntary contributions to the translation business, but we have not actively seeked for them. Uh, on the other hand, we have systematically paid translators to uh, translate. And uh, this is something I believe makes sense uh, from the ethical and practical point of view, and this is what we would like to keep doing in the future. So, uh, a very, very short timeline of what has happened. Uh, 2017, the, the realization that Wittgenstein's works were going to be in the public domain soon enough. At the end of 2020, the domain wittgensteinproject.org was registered and the website site uh, was installed. Uh, we uploaded most of the originals in 2021 and started preparing translations. Uh, already some people volunteered during that year, and of course the project went online the day uh, Wittgenstein's works entered the public domain in Europe, and again, many other countries around the world, so the 1st of January. At that point, many people volunteered uh, to translate, to help with editing and proofreading the texts that had been or were being translated, to help with organizing, and I forgot to mention, improving the uh, technological infrastructure of the website. We got funding for paying, in order to pay for those translations, from two main donors, the Wikimedia Italia NGO and the University of Milan. 
We have 32 texts currently online. 15 of them are original language texts and 21 are previously unpublished translations. There are a few previously published translations. The, sorry, the sum is not 32, is it? I, I made a mistake there. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 36 probably. Yes, I just wrote 32 instead of... No, that's not true because there are some previously published translations. I really just made a mistake. I am sorry. I will send out the uh, updated and uh, corrected edition of this slide. Uh, 11 languages are represented. Uh, we had lots of visitors in the first few days. Uh, later on, we, uh, let's say, the, the average number stabilized. Uh, right now, on average, we are having about 23 unique visitors and 74 page views a day. And the total number of unique visitors and page views in 2022 is respectively, uh, respectively 11,000 and 33,000. The question becomes, where do we go from here? Uh, we would like to keep on translating, but that requires prioritizing uh, languages and titles. Uh, we would really like to discuss the issue of how to prioritize those things. We might want to focus on texts that have not yet been translated into a given language, translations that have been uh, done but are poor or outdated, specifically in underrepresented languages. And, and again, there might be uh, many more criteria which we really need to uh, not necessarily carve in stone, but, but, but be very clear about before moving on. And I mentioned the importance of gathering extant materials, trying to save uh, existing translations from oblivion if they fall out of the uh, print business, uh, but also, uh, again, carrying on with the work of uh, philologically diving into the difference between published editions and knockless uh, scripts in order to determine whether something more could be published. And actually, there definitely is more to be published. Uh, for example, uh, the coded uh, di diaries uh, definitely are worth publishing. We didn't do that yet, but we believe we could. This is something we need to look into and at some point find the time to do. I will you know, just very quickly uh, move on to the third part, which, as I mentioned, is super closely intertwined with the second, because what we would like to do also is a question from the strictly technological point of view. What do we already have there? Uh, good accessibility. I mentioned the availability of screen readers uh, for visually impaired people. Good mobile support in case you want to disprove your friend over dinner with a Wittgenstein citation. A feature for exporting the texts in PDF, Markdown, EPUB, and MUBI is coming very soon, thanks to the amazing work of Frederick. And this is also very important because I mentioned how we focus on the general public as our main target and being able to download a clean and uh, easy to read edition is crucial from that point of view. Some people will use the website while doing research for their thesis, for their whatever, and so the web version is ideal. Some others will want to have something to read on an uh, armchair, and that's where we are trying to go as well. We did create a tree-like view of the Tractatus, which can be improved still, but from, let's say, the, the, our version of the tree view, uh, sorry, our version of the tree-like Tractatus is much worse than the Iowa Tractatus map, admittedly, but for example, it's the only one in Spanish and Italian. Uh, so I, we will try to improve it, but uh, at least the multilingual support is very good there. And then we did some funny things. Uh, this is something I should not waste time talking about right now, but there is a remark in Zettel where Wittgenstein talks about the four-dimensional cube and does not put any pictures there, but hints at the fact that a picture should be there. A picture was made by the editors of the paper edition, and because it was the editor's choice, we thought, well, why not make our own choice? Uh, and we did, and because it's a website, it's an animated one. It's, this is silly and unimportant, but the possibilities are unlimited. And what is it that we, let's say, what is it that we know that we need or want? And then again, uh, we accept 
uh, we're very glad to accept feedback about what could be helpful. Uh, a better search engine, definitely, even though the purpose of our search will never be too similar to the purpose of, for example, semantic search or ontological search that are provided by other uh, services. The one that we have can still very much be improved upon. Could be interesting because this is a multilingual edition to provide links to other editions as well. Uh, let's say so within a text, uh, make it as easy as possible for the user to jump from one edition to the other. Right now, generally speaking, all translations point uh, remark by remark to the original, whether it's German or English, but it could also be necessary, uh, not necessary, but nice to, to, to make uh, users be able to jump from the German to any other language uh, if they would like. Uh, it, so one thing that we believe uh, could be improved is uh, the ease of tracing a remark back to its origin uh, in the NACLAS, if of course the remark originates in the NACLAS. And this is something that will require a lot of design thinking and a lot of work to implement, but it's in the wish list. And yeah, so far, that's it. Uh, but then again, this is something we could definitely build upon with the input by users. And because right now the time is not going to be enough, uh, please keep in mind that we, would, we will always be very, very happy to hear from you via email uh, at any time. Let's try to leave the last 15 minutes for questions and comments. a very good point. Uh, I think that uh, we already agreed in a previous conversation that transcribing a text is a rule following process. As such, it can be straightforward and it can even be something that in we can say in terms we do intuitively without thinking, or it can be something which forces us to stop and uh, I would say decide how to uh, go on the uh, the, the um, issue is, of course, to put a boundary in a continuum uh, because, I, again, I believe there are some cases that are truly straightforward. Uh, transcribing a text like, you know, Dostoevsky characters, who does that as a job, uh, copyists in a state uh, bureau, who are paid to produce copies. That's the job that would have been done by a zeros if they had one in the, 18th, in the 19th century in Russia. And I mean, that's definitely not going to create a new layer of copyright. Uh, and then of course, there is editorial work in which, uh, for example, alternatives are normalized, et cetera, and that I think can really count as original. Mechanical, me talking about something mechanical is not giving a solution, it's just proposing a metaphor for saying exactly the same thing. Uh, I would like to disconnect this metaphor from the literal meaning of it. I'm not talking about a machine being able to do something when I say that that something is mechanical. Again, what a uh, copyist did when zero zs did not exist uh, was mechanical. Uh, in this sense, which of course can be arbit arbitrary, but, but it is uh, probably acceptable. Um, and you're right, actually some knowledge is always necessary. I, 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 I was thinking about, uh, I, we got permission also thanks to the help of Sasha 
to uh, republish the French translation made by Granger of the Tractatus on our website. That means that this winter I will spend my Sundays uh, scanning and transcribing, partly with the help of OCR, that text from a print book. Transcribing words is straightforward. It might be argued that to transcribe the sum sign in the formula about the number of possibilities that exists for combinations requires you to at least understand what that symbol means and be able to look it up in the Microsoft Word formula tool or to translate it into LaTeX, which is more relevant to our case. And uh, it's true that requires some knowledge, but does that require creativity, originality? Translating into a standard, I mean, for instance, LaTeX and IKEA implies creativity. I mean, I mean, in a sense, of course, it is a word, right? You mean translating in the sense of from one language to another? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, from yes. From one language to natural, from whatever you want. Of course, it is a word, mm -hmm. but in a sense, quite. Uh, There may be degrees of uh, there may be degrees of what of when I I I I I really like it. Okay, let, let, let's say that about translations, there is uh, a lot of consensus. There are those kind of legal sources that you can find. A translation is a creative work. Uh, there's no need for me to interpret there because there is already a widely, widely it's accepted. Law and just about every kind yes. Of law is, yes. Uh, um, I say that. In <laughs> we will have a quick reply from Alice and then go to an audience question by Alice. Just two points. I think it's great that you invite us to bring the Keshav and for in any year, which hopefully we can continue in the But I simply don't understand why making choices is the, the point of difference. The medieval copies which in Europe and the deep technology are to count as mechanical. They made choices, and that's why many of the mistakes in the manuscripts came about. They made choices. Can I follow uh, A mistake is not a choice, though. <laughs> um, the, 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 I found the, 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 the analogy with the, with the, with the uh, copyists uh, whether they're from medieval times or from from, ancient, uh, from, from, from Renaissance Italy, uh, we know the names of some of them. And we know their names because they did interesting things with the manuscripts, right? Um, take a, take a, 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 an ISO 84 sheet of paper. This is a known uh, proportion uh, from the Middle Ages, right? And we know this is a proportion from the Middle Ages because scribes use this proportion uh, of this kind of paper, this, this exact size paper, to do the exact thing that we do with it today, so that we can have a, a, we can have a rotating proportion that stays the same regardless of how I fold the page. Um, this also has to do with the way that they carved up the, li uh, the, the lines in the paper. Um, it turns out that uh, they, one, one classic way of, uh, of putting things to the paper, determining line length and so on, was by dividing the, uh, was dividing the length of the, the, the page by nine. And then the line height was divided, whatever that number was, was divided by two or three. And you got, you got a certain thing in certain portions of pages, you get between 27 and 20 and, and 31 lines of, uh, on a sheet of paper. These are all choices that are made regardless of how, how, how mechanical it may seem. And then, uh, and that's just, uh, that's just sort of the way that you're looking at it, right? So that it's presented in a manner that you can, uh, that will hopefully not just be Understandable to, 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 to the reader, but also aesthetically pleasing, right? That was, that was a driving thought behind the manuscripts. That's why they illuminated them in the, uh, in the first place. And then you have the, uh, um, the other side that not all scribes had the same handwriting. Certain scribes were, 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 um, were, were, uh, were, were hired to do certain work because of the kinds of scripts that they were able to do. Some of them had commanded uh, four or five different scripts. So they would, and then different scripts were used for different purposes. The, um, uh, the Roman Catholic Church had a papal script that, that, that it used for official correspondence. So when we say it's a mechanical copy, um, and that the, the, the idea of choices, I, I understand the, the, the confusion because they're, the, the, from choosing the, the kind of paper you're putting it on, 
to, to, to the color to, to the color eight to the line the line height to the to, to the line uh, the line we call it measure the, the, the line height etc. Choosing how to expand the aggregation exactly all of those things yes 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 all of those things and, and those are all choices so I, I guess the question uh, there is an interesting question there, and I guess in, in, has this been settled in, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in the as far as you're, you've seen the legal dis discussions. Um, because I, I don't doubt that there's a, a legal understanding of the term that would just completely deviate from all of what, what, what we just said. But <laughs> I, I, I've seen it happen before, and I, I, I completely believe that it would happen. Um, but we know that that is in fact the case. That it has that, that the term mechanical has deviated so far from our general understanding of, 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 of Not what counts as, 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 as mechanical. Mm, not that I know of. Let, sorry. No, actually, I believe mechanical has been used in this sense, uh, but what I have been talking, what I've been calling mechanical is maybe called faithful in legal papers. Faithful, faithful reproduction. Um, actually, uh, I, I, at this point, I definitely agree with you that talking about choices was suboptimal. Um, it's not something I did after thinking about a lot. I was really just looking for synonyms to make myself understood. And what I should have said would have been creative choices. And then, of course, I would have just repeated what I had said before, because the issue is what is creative and what is not. Um, faithfulness is a good way of putting it, even though obviously faithfulness is a continuum as well. So you're going to have to trace a limit at some point. Um, but it, it is the kind of field where you sometimes have to work with similar cases, with analogies, with metaphors. Uh, asking yourself whether this could be done by a machine or not is often fruitful in this kind of context, even if it's not the only question. It's not an experiment on crutches that can tell you whether or not something is creative or not. Uh, so really, it's, it's definitely fuzzy. Uh, as far as I know, I've been looking for precedents, and uh, as some of you may know, I found precedents as far as the authorship issue is concerned, examples of cases in which an editor's work was or was not considered uh, to be creative and to therefore generate a new layer of copyright. I haven't been able to find precedents that deal specifically with transcriptions. I am still looking. If anybody here or on Zoom knows of anything, please do write to me. Uh, I would be very happy to have something uh, already, uh, you know, discussed by experts to base myself upon. Oh, sure. I'm sorry, but I don't see the notifications here. <coughs> Please go ahead. Hi, Michele. May I ask a question? Absolutely. Hi. Um, Just two, two very short things. No, no, I don't know if there are questions. First, the ethical aspect, which you mentioned briefly, and also David Stern yesterday, um, translating Wittgenstein, now translating the Tractatus, because obviously it is for free. And um, enterprising nations like the United States, for example, uh, and publishers who have powerful PR machines uh, are taking the tractatus, although obviously they are from a scholarly point of view, other works, they are well, the culture and value is not really a work by Wittgenstein and uh, we know everything about it. But uh, uh, whatever is cheaper or costs absolutely nothing, but, but brings money. Um, I just think that it is worth uh, thinking about uh, what the so-called broad audience needs, uh, whether anybody's personal vanity of making some money and s giving their, their personal opinion about the Tractatus or any other text. Um, so the ethics of uh, translating and disseminating Wittgenstein, a philosopher who took such care of every single word he ever wrote, also in personal correspondence, not only in his philosophical works. And then uh, just for the future, as uh, the Ludwig Wittgenstein project is, uh, as you explained, uh, directed towards uh, the so-called uh, uh, non, 
uh, non-specialized audience, people who might have never read the Tractatus, I would say people who don't necessarily know who exactly Wittgenstein is, because there is a lot of these people who, however, are a potential audience. Uh, I think it, it would be worthy for the um, traditional, for the scientific uh, scholarly Wittgenstein community to think who is this broad audience, because there might be surprises there. I think one should be reaching out to thinking people, or people willing to think um, in a new, in a, in a non-compromising way, especially in these times. Uh, what I have encountered, uh, encountered until now is uh, broad audiences, for example, Platonists or Aristotelians or Heideggerians. This is not broad, these are philosophers. Broad audience is somebody who has, who wants to think, who has read some books, but is willing to open, I think. Uh, this is all from me. I don't want to take more of your time. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is good input indeed. Um, we th actually that's something we need to um, add to the wish list. Uh, and I had think I had been thinking about this essentially a survey to learn about our audience, not only know how many they are, but who they are, and most importantly, what they would like to see. Thank you. We are a bit uh, over time, on, yes. but we might have one last question from Alexander Berg. Yes, actually, if you want to take it. No, yes, no, please take it. Um, mm -hmm. Please, please do ask the question. Uh, the, the, the thing is, uh, they're going to kick us out at half past twelve. Uh, so I, I did want to have a buffer to prevent the same as yesterday evening to happen. But I, I think at least fifteen minutes, at least ten minutes, we can really go on if we would like. If you would like. Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you for your work and um, so providing such a the, like um, open information, like, like uh, that connection to the philosophy with our fathers. Actually, I um, one problem um, with like editions of Wittgenstein because uh, every seminar we look at the um, literary forms of philosophy, so, so I try to introduce Wittgenstein and, and uh, students are mostly like uh, German studies department students who want to and, and they are not familiar with Wittgenstein, so I wanted to look with them uh, onto the editions, so, so when they can look from like a form perspective, from an outside perspective, how the books were made, how, how the texts were like structured and so on. And I've seen that you, uh, on your side, you have um, a lot of proof of uh, showing the dictionary for, for um, schools. Um, it's like a facsimile edition. And, um, but in the Tractatus, for example, you have uh, like only the text, you can't see the, the, the original pages ended and so on. And um, I mean, especially for that special purpose, it would be nice to see how the Tractatus would have, as a for the, the purpose of the seminar, how the Tractatus would have um, looked for the readers for many, many years, uh, to languages, one book, like pages, and so on. And I wanted to provide that to the students, and I did not find any good like, PDF resource for that. Um, so, so maybe you can provide such flexibility additions to in the future, or what was your uh, approach in that direction? I mean, we have facsimiles from like end writings in on other sources, but uh, yeah. Thank you, yes. Interesting thing, question, thank you. This is something I had not been thinking about at all, uh, but it is a potential way forward. Uh, the reason why the Dictionary for Schools is only available in a facsimile edition is that we still hadn't, haven't had the time to transcribe it, uh, and we thought it would be anyway preferable to have something than have nothing. Um, but you are right that the PDF can actually be useful for a different purpose, but it can actually be useful. Um, 
I don't see a rights issue there because some legislations do protect the layout choices. Uh, but that's actually, the, the United Kingdom is an example. Uh, so you can't photocopy a book, even if it's in the public domain, even if the text is in the public domain, because the choices the designer made in terms of page layout are protected. This is actually not even copyright. This is just a device to prevent publishers to reprint other publishers' books. Uh, and it's a very short period of time. It's 15 years from the publication of the book. Uh, so that would not be an issue for any of Wittgenstein's texts that we're talking about, at least not, not, nothing that is not super recent. Um, and in countries which don't have this provision, Honestly, I think the reason they don't have it is they don't think that kind of work is creative and worth protecting. Uh, this should be looked into. This is not something I have researched, but this was just to, to, to briefly touch onto the, the copyright issue that might arise here. Uh, as to the usefulness of what you propose, I agree completely. If we had um, good quality PDF scans of past editions uh, that could be a further resource, maybe maybe less targeted at our main audience, but still something that would be nice to have for, for actually for students anyway, for, you know, in, in, a, in a kind of fashion that is guided by a lecturer or teacher, but, but it could definitely be useful. So uh, let's say we, we are open to starting things without necessarily having a plan on how to carry on with them if this does not create obvious holes. So for example, we do have a feature for downloading ebooks from the site. We only have one ebook. Actually, we have two. Sorry, we have two. That's not a problem. I mean, we don't ha we don't need to have an ebook for at least fifty percent of the texts before starting publishing them. We can go in a very incremental way. So, if we have one PDF in addition to the Wörterbuch, then 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 let's upload it. I would say uh, we will need to find a visual device that makes it clear how it is available, why it is available, if there are multiple versions, something to explain what they are, etc. But this can be done easily enough, I should say. Mm. Yes? <laughs> Who's that? Sorry, I... I, I. Otherwise, Okay, that is the last one. Um, one thing that, and this is partly a question for you and partly for the room as a whole. Um, I mean, we've talked a lot about legal issues today, and um, even though I think I agree with most of the points that, that you raised in, in terms of legal issues, um, as we have also heard, some of these cases are in the end decided in court, right? And I think in the Wittgenstein community, or perhaps in the community as a whole it would, of course, be preferable to not even come to this point, but rather to talk to the institutions that are involved and to actually hear what they think about these legal issues. So far, my impression has been that due to an either unintentional or intentional vagueness, it's very hard to tell what the legal stance of the different institutions actually is. Because, and I will just take one example, but, um, we have been talking about the, the copyright situation in the UK, and as far as I can tell, the only um, the only somewhat legal opinion that we've heard on that from, for example, Trinity College, was one talk given by Johnson Smith, which I think might have been reported, but it's definitely not been any part of, let's say, an official statement on the website of Trinity College, at least as far as I know. And so my question would be. Um, what are the, the possibilities in the future to perhaps gain a bit of clarity about what the, the reliable legal opinions of the different institutions might be? And, Alois, please go ahead. Let me just first add that Jonathan Smith always qualified his statement as his own personal opinion, not to be of Trinity College Cambridge. So we don't have any from Trinity College. So yes. We have some correspondence. Uh, McKinn has had some correspondence with Trinity. Um, so if, if I may just 
not to speak for the University of Berlin because I'm not the University of Berlin and I'm not the right comments in the transcription, transcriptions of the Education Archives, but I have uh, at the University of Berlin requested a formal assessment uh, of the question to what extent. Uh, what my reasoning at the University of Berlin, and I, 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 I do subscribe to that view, my reasoning at the University of Berlin has the view that uh, the transcriptions uh, um, can claim a separate layer of copyright protection because our transcriptions uh, are sufficiently creative that they deserve that special layer, but this is no formal statement. And I've asked the university to assess the situation under this respect. Of course, we have we have no other claims than claims to our transcriptions and use of our transcriptions. Um, yes, definitely, and it's great to hear that, that at least there will then hopefully publish something like this in the future uh, regarding the conversation with John. Yes, um, well, uh, there is a paper about the issue of copyright by myself that is hopefully coming out, uh, in which I will make the claims I made today in a clearer fashion and, of course, uh, in a written form. So. Before publishing such paper, I was in touch with Alois, with, with whom the conversation goes on, uh, which I really like, and with uh, the current librarian of the uh, REN library in Trinity, Mr. Nicholas Bell, and he did give me very insightful uh, input uh, and actually corrected one objective mistake that I made. Uh, but. All in all, they had no objections to the main claims I make in the paper, and the claims I made in the paper are the claims I made today. So that's going to be in print, and the statement that the paper, an earlier version of the paper was discussed with Trinity is going to be in a footnote. And of course, once it's there, uh, let's say it's the last word until someone says another more recent word. I mean, not, not the right word, but the last. Okay, maybe it's safe to leave the room before, before they kick us out.